Okay, Doubts Aloud listeners, for all of you or any of you that might be hanging on to us, um, we are back. Now, I say that in a little bit of a funny way because this podcast will likely turn up in the average uh, monthly time, and so you'll know no difference. But for us three, it feels like we haven't recorded for a long time because we normally record in the middle of the month, but last time we did two together, Ed's been away. Maybe, Ed, you could just mention a little bit about that. Um, and so now we're recording very close to the date. And so it just seems like it's a little reunion here coming back to record. <laughs> so, um, Ed and Francis, what have you been up to? Um, I've just come back from my skiing holiday. Ah, uh, ah well, OK. <laughs> It's all, right for some. it's all right for yeah. some. <laughs> Ed, it's a little bit different. Well, I always had a lovely time in hot Malawi um, while you were shivering in the February. Oh, I was not uh, shivering. I was not shivering. It was lovely and warm. Oh, yes, that's right. Yes, yes, that's right. Um, do, I was doing a project with solar panels um, for warming up water and that kind of thing. So I'd um, love to talk about it sometime, but it's not really that relevant. Um, no, but it will be to, um, you know, that co- podcast a couple of times ago on the... Global yes, yeah, yep. yeah. Yes, and so, you yep. know, um, yeah, so... Uh, yes, and I keep, I keep threatening to talk about my uh, book on polygamy in, Bala- in Christian Malawi. Um, yeah, yes, yep. that's something on the cards as well. So, <laughs> yes. yeah, very interesting. So, yeah, yeah so, I'm looking forward to that. Yep, yep, Maggie's especially. Mm-hmm. So um, in that time, and it seems like we've been a long time away recording, we've actually, um, in this episode, we're going to talk about the three unbelievable sessions that, in fact, um, uh, were three great subjects, and we're going to sort of have a proportionate amount of time on each of them today. And so, um, Ed, can you just tell us about, just in a nutshell, just the three subjects? Yes, for sure. Well, um, the group is our uh, London discussion group that um, we kind of, uh, with Justin's blessing, um, has the unbelievable kind of brand thing associated with it. Um, And we get together uh, first Monday of the month and um, the idea is discussion, but usually we have a speaker first. Uh, In January, we had the great uh, Dennis Alexander, who's pretty well known for his work on creation and evolution. Uh, He is a scientist, um, but he focuses on the kind of theological side of how uh, fully embracing evolution is compatible with Christianity. Then we had Francis and uh, uh, Bruce Blackshaw doing a debate, which was informal. It wasn't at all kind of confrontational um they did a debate on abortion and that uh, and a lovely discussion followed on from that which uh, they were both really informative on um and then in march we had james crossley who's um quite well known to to many of us he's uh, an agnostic but also a new testament scholar he's moved on to other things as well um, and he just concentrated on Mark's gospel at our request, and it was a great evening. So that's what's coming. Yeah, and um, Francis, uh, it's interesting, well, both of you, actually, it's interesting that in those three sessions, we've had, um, I think on the first one, it was Ed and I there, but no Francis. On the on the next one, it was, um, well, it was all of us, because Francis did it, and then the next one, Ed wasn't there, and it was me and Francis. So um, yeah. uh, it's, it's interesting how we, you, each of us can learn a little bit if we've missed something from from those which is um great anyway to do this so um okay so um we're going to first of all talk about the subject with dennis alexander um topic on creation and evolution and i think his book if i'm right ed was do we have to choose or evolution creation do we have to choose yeah so i'll give it exact so people can google it creation or evolution colon do we have to choose and he's also written more, another one more recently, Is There Purpose in Biology? Question mark, the Cost of Existence and the Love of God. Well, I always think um, I'm going to I'll sort of lead on this one with Denix Alexander uh, on this subject. This is my kind of baby subject, if you like. It's because as an evangelical or fundamentalist teenager back in the day. Um, this, was the, this was the thing that I was kind of into, or one of the major... I don't know, uh, sort of legs of my faith, I suppose, was all to do with this issue of interest. 
And of course, if somebody had posed that question to me, creation, evolution, that would be the Bible says and probably cast the demon of evolution mm -hmm. out of somebody. To be honest, it was like evolution was simply the opposite of <laughs> almost Christianity, to be honest. Um, certain feelings like that until I got a little older and a little wiser, I felt in the faith that is. Mm. So, um, so to me, uh, coming from a young earth creationist sort of background and struggling with even issues on there, obviously evolutionists were like, if you were a Christian and an evolutionist, this was, this was strange for me. This was something like, wow, you know, um, and, and little did I know about the, the, the mass of the world's say Bible scholars or whatever that probably weren't young earth creationists. I didn't know that at the time. So, um, the outline of this particular discussion group with Dennis was really um, jumping, I suppose, right in with the assumption that, in fact, evolution is compatible with the Christian faith. And this is the he's one of the sort of, I suppose, your po poster boys, maybe for if you want to be a serious evangelical Christian and accept mainstream science on the evolution question or not even question, but on evolutionary science, this is your guy. Um, total opposite to say someone like Ken Ham, if you've heard of Ken Ham and the Young Earth Creationist Movement. Um, and so I, I, was, I was there listening to Dennis from this kind of background for me. So I had questions much more interested in theological integration. Ed or Francis, you come maybe from a different angle at even hearing Dennis. And so uh, what, when you were sitting there before he started speaking, what kind of thoughts did you have? I am surprised at... Um the number of um, people there are Christians who don't believe in evolution because there was never any suggestion when I was growing up that you had, you couldn't, you couldn't believe in evolution. I mean, I just don't remember that being an issue. The first time, well, I suppose when I was about 10, when we lived briefly in South Africa, that was where I first came across people who believed in the literal truth of uh, the Adam and Eve story. And, and the, the, our reaction as a family was, ooh, how weird is that? They will believe that, uh, you know, the story of Adam and Eve is literally true. Um, yeah. So, you know, I mean, I, I guess I come from this uh, fairly, um, you know, non-evangelical, pretty centre stream um background when i was being brought up as as at least nominally a christian and so um yeah my only um uh, reaction would be surprise that there has to be a debate about it i guess wow yeah yeah um i i remember when i was um when i was sort of learning a bit more about this sort of integration idea um, that actually the question, even the question is begging itself. Like the idea is uh, we'd, we'd have a, um, a thing in the young people's group and it would be creation or evolution. You've, you've set the stacked cards up right there with even the statement creation or evolution. And so, um, and it's like, obviously we're creationists because we're Christians and evolutionists are kind of non-Christians. You almost thought like that, to be honest. Um, or you were weird Christians or not understanding if you were evolutionary Christians. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so, but, but, but actually theistic evolutionists, as, we'll, as Dennis Alexander would say he is, would actually also describe themselves as evolutionary creationists. So it wouldn't be fair in someone like Dennis's point of view to say creation or evolution. It would be um, young earth creation or old earth creation or evolutionary creationism. Um, and so they're all forms of creation I have problems with that, but that's how that camp of theistic evolutionists would describe themselves. Yeah, no, I, that was the complete standard, particularly in Britain, for, from fairly soon after Darwin right through to the 60s. Absolutely. Mm. And it slowly grew, this, yeah. sort of, uh, yeah. this conflict idea. And uh, yeah. I, so I was in Cambridge in the eight, early 80s, and really it was all the way. Um, and the only issue we thought was how you interpret days in Genesis 1. Didn't really go anywhere else. And that seemed to be enough. Um, and what's the, what's, the, what's the fuss? Right. Well, I mean, the actual fuss is enormous, actually. Because, well, yeah, um, I, I see that now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, and so it's, it's surprising. I mean, it's not surprising to me to see that you do have a reactionary group because of where evolution 
uh, in its concepts takes you and 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 the integration with ultimate theology of the of the bible so it's actually quite interesting but but yes I, it, it it is interesting that people that are sort of version certain versions of christians certainly say what's the problem and then um and then you find that you stumble across young earth creation and you realize from their point of view it's a, it, it's an, an incredible problem that almost that the faith is compromised completely if you, if you start to embrace evolution. Mm. And I, I actually I sympathize with certain points, certain points of that. Um, but um, so with Dennis, of course, um, I would have liked to have had a young earth creationist sort of really intelligent uh, orator anyway, at least. Um, you might want to question a young earth <laughs> creationist intelligence, but actually you do get some intelligent people because they mm. take the word of God as the grounding in a certain reading and that's it. Everything else has to fit that story. And, um, and then that they'll, they'll do anything they can, I think, to try and fit any evidence that there is out there to try and fit the story rather than let the story be misread or something, which is, yeah. which is where this sort of thing goes. Um, so, I mean, is there any particular points Ed, you being there, that um, really sort of um, you found interesting, either problematic yeah, so for I, evolution. Once he has to actually explain it all, because of course, as a as a Christian, I could sort of just bury and not look not to look too carefully. Yeah. But once you actually have to coherently explain it all, yeah, the holes do seem to appear a bit. Yes. So uh, he had to have some version of Adam and Eve yeah. because of he embraces his evangelicalism and his way he sees Romans in particular. Yep. Um, he has to have something there. And he called it um, that uh, there was this sort of time when humankind was in touch with God um, magically. Not, he didn't quite explain how that arose. Uh, and then as people became more morally aware they slipped away from god um and i'm not really sure that science could ever go with that because our morals are part of our our evolution um we see morality in chimpanzees and uh, you know good and bad tribal um behavior yeah. being beastly to chimps who are outside the group and all that sort of thing as well as supporting their own um so I can't see how you could um, have this idea. He called it Homo Divinitatis, which yeah. was this sort of pre pre fall humankind. Yeah, I mean, it's um, this is this is where it really really gets interesting, and this is where you can then turn to the young Earth creationists. I mean, you know my thing on diversity. I like to sit with my arms crossed and just watch a young Earth talk to a theistic evolution, and then you say, "See the problems." In other words, all. The young earth will make very good theological points. And you go, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course, that makes sense with the Bible and da, da, da. And then the other guy will rip the science apart of the young earth creationists. And you go, yeah, of course, of course, of course. So, uh, science seems to be well on the way to what actually is the reality of this universe. And then I sat back and go, well, where can you go? Because you've got, you know, the, the theology just is embarrassing, I feel, with theistic evolutionists. But the science is absolutely embarrassing with the young earth creationists. And yes. so um, mm -hmm. you've got a massive, massive problem. And so I got to a position where, I mean, if you read, um, for example, say something like Ken Ham's books or the Young Earth Creationist books, they, they do make it within its own trapped worldview. I mean, it almost seems like an ancient cosmology view of anything in the way they talk. But they just have a certain way of reading, literally as you can, and that's it. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, but the theology fits because the theology there for them is that adam and eve had a fall they were the first people from that came death death to the planet um and then original sin is all part of that and then romans ties in the first man the last adam the salvation that comes to man it, it does make theological sense in a way when you read it like that and so evolution comes along and knocks out the original man and says there was no original Adam and Eve, and man slowly evolved from um, sort of um, uh, common ancestors, you know, and, and d diverged, and we get you know, big-brained sort of Homo sapiens sapiens or whatever they, they talk yeah. like, and it just doesn't fit that theological narrative. And so this is where Ed, you would realise when you when you unpack it, and Francis, there is a problem um, mm. because uh, yes, I think the problems 
uh, well, maybe I'll put it a different way, but I think it's even bigger than what you've said because, um, well, say someone like Justin Riley, he's our kind of poster, poster boy of someone who's sensible but Christian. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, um, and he will say that uh, suffering in the world and, and those sort of problems is because it's broken, because it's fallen. And he, he uses that in his book and he's said it in, in his video response to, you know, remember Stephen Fry going off on one on RSTV? Yeah, with the word. Yeah, that's what we all remember that. He did the response video and yep. basically he was saying, well, the world is, we've broken, the world's broken because of us. Um, and that really cannot make sense if you embrace the science. You don't even really need to embrace evolution. You just need to look at the fossil record yeah. and see that animals are chomping into each other and have their parasites and all the rest of it. And um, yeah, uh, 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 before yeah. humans were around to mess things up. Yeah. I often, I often say that um, death and suffering didn't come into the world because of man. Man came into the world because of death, death and, and suffering. suffering. Absolutely. And, and what you've just said there, Francis, you would absolutely be applauded if you spoke at the um, Creation Museum that Ken Ham runs um, for saying just that, because that's exactly what they say evolution teaches. And therefore, that's why right. they reject it. Do you see what I mean? Right. So yes, there, yeah. there is actually a, a bedfellow situation between the sort of atheist evolutionist and the young earth creationist they actually both agree that they're incompatible yeah. <laughs> yes. and, yeah. and it's, it's people like dennis alexander go oh no no no, no. we're gonna have them both and yeah. um we're gonna make this uh baby walk as it were you know and <laughs> they do it in a very very intelligent sophisticated way i mean Ed, we went to that conference. These yes, I was thinking people. of that just, most, just as you were... These are yeah. lovely, intelligent people. They are struggling because they can't be the atheist who rejects it. Well, Dennis himself is a lovely, intelligent person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we're all lovely, intelligent people, but it's just <laughs> like, it's just like, um, it's like uh, there's only certain people... You know, there is a similarity between Richard Dawkins and Ken Ham would probably have a very good meal together and say, we do agree evolution <laughs> means this. <laughs> and that's why Christianity is bullshit to Richard Dawkins. And yes. that's why evolution is a complete and utter, um, I don't know, conspiracy delusion to Ken Ham. There yeah. is a bedfellow there and I see it. I see it. And um, it, but someone like Dennis comes in the middle and, and, and tries to, I would say, ultimately, ultimately, with all the intelligence and due respect, is trying to have a cake and eat it. Yes. Is what he's saying, um, tell me, um, you know, because as I've said, I wasn't there, but is his idea that there was a time when we didn't really understand the difference between good and evil and therefore couldn't really choose to do evil. And as we became more, as we evolved to be more intelligent, we came to a point where we could understand that something we wanted to do was evil. And it was at yeah. that point that we fell because we yeah. chose to do what we wanted to do by then knowing it was evil rather than in some innocent way, not really appreciating that it was evil. But I mean, but, I mean you're yeah, but, absolutely right. That's exactly what they try to do. And I cannot see how that works. But yeah, the, the, we yeah. ate of the fruit of the yeah. tree, of, tree of knowledge of good and evil. But we weren't, that, that, that's only meaningful if we already know about that. Yes. It, oh, you know, yeah, the, I, I agree. Breaking you know, some they, command of God is, is um, I mean, I, I, it just doesn't work. I, I just, I, yeah, sorry, when Dennis was talking, I just couldn't get my head around it. You, you, so you've got sort of, I don't know, you've got Homo sapiens battling it out with Neanderthals and killing each other, and maybe there's raping and stealing, and goodness knows what's happening. And then suddenly, you have this awareness, what, with two hominids or something, not, not Neanderthals, but two homo, hominids of Homo sapiens or whatever, and um, they are then suddenly, I don't know, uh, magically suddenly different, and then they, they, they think, oh, well, we probably have some intuition of God, and then suddenly they do something wrong, and then you've got the fall. It just, I cannot see how in a bunch and population of, if you're trying to have a video, say, of the events, how it could possibly be um, I think the young earthists would better say God made two people out of the dust of the earth and had them in a literal garden. I think that would make more sense. 
if if you had a, it, it's an unreality to me. But I mean, it would make more sense <laughs> if it was a reality. Um, yeah. Because I can't. Yeah. Because you've got a fall. You've got original human beings. You've got. Um, you know, as Jesus said, I was I said to Ed before we did the show that Jesus quote, which young earths use all the time. Uh, it was not so from the beginning when he made them male and female. Uh, well, what was the beginning we're talking about here? Well, the beginning of a sort of a pea soup of thousands of hominids and one of them suddenly has a insight about God. I cannot see that that's what Jesus would mm. have been purported to mm-hmm. be thinking about. You know, <laughs> uh, he would have been thinking of the story that's been gone down through the Israelite history. Um, and so um, that raises the question on what, what did yeah. Jesus believe? <laughs> yes. Um, you know. This whole whole answer that the uh, this this uh, um, Genesis one to three answers the question of suffering uh, is a non-starter, and that's I mean, probably we need to cover it uh, more elsewhere. But um, uh, and I'm not sure even if Dennis certainly the people in the Oxford conference uh, didn't think uh, there was an answer in in Genesis as to why they're suffering. Rather than staring it in the face and saying, actually, we have no answers and maybe it's a problem for the faith so big that it's just insurmountable. But no, every, it seemed to be intelligent people were doing anything they could to find an answer that made sense to the troubling brain, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I felt sorry that there wasn't really any answers. There were just different answers mm. that yeah. didn't necessarily all work. You know. Well, uh, yeah. that, that's what they always say, isn't it? That the more intelligent you are, um, the better ways you'll find to come up with coping with your cognitive dissonance. That's so well put, Francis. That should be... <laughs> yeah. um, that's, Le- um, Leah, let's, that's great. Let's round it off with that. Yes, <laughs> I think that rounds off uh, this, uh, the first third now of talking on these um, talks at the Unbelievable Discussion Group. I think that was great. Francis, over to yes. you. Uh, yes, okay, so in February, I had um, a debate that I'd been wanting to have for a while, actually, on the subject of abortion, which is one of my um, big topics. Um, and my opponent, and uh, as you've already explained, Ed, this wasn't a formal debate. This was more like a kind of a general discussion with some, a bit of a talk being given by uh, both of us. And then we asked each other a few questions and then threw it open to the meeting. Um, but it was uh, my, my uh, opponent, for want of a better word, was uh, Bruce Blackshaw, um, lovely chap. Uh, he's actually doing a PhD on the ethics of abortion at Birmingham University. So, um, you know, very well-informed, interesting person to have this discussion with. Yeah. Um, so I took uh, the point that I always take, that's my foundational point for discussing abortion, which is the argument from the woman's bodily autonomy, and um, I uh, argued along the lines of uh, Judith Jar- Jarvis Thompson's um, violinist thought experiment, which is found in her paper, A Defense of Abortion. And, uh, that's um, quite perhaps- a few years ago, isn't it? Oh, yes. It's about the 19... Is it the 1960s, I think? The late 60s, yeah. early 70s. I can't remember. But it's, it's, um, it is quite old now. Um, Shall I uh, just roughly outline what the violinist thought experiment is for those who aren't familiar with it? Okay. Okay, so um, uh, Thompson asks you to imagine that um, you wake up in hospital and you find that you are attached through um, a series of um, tubes to a man uh, who you've never seen before. And the director of the hospital comes to you and says, um, I'm terribly sorry, but uh, the person you're attached to is a, is a violinist. He's a very famous violinist, and he is dying because his kidneys have failed. Um, you were kidnapped by the Society of Music Lovers who wanted to save his life, and you've been attached to him. And... Um, you need to stay attached to him for nine months because if you de- de- detach yourself from him, then he will inevitably die. And this is not something that the hospital had anything to do with it. Do with we think it's appalling. You know, we we would never have agreed to it. But there you are. 
you're in the situation now. You cannot possibly now, um, we cannot possibly allow you to detach yourself from him because he's a human and uh, his right to life as a human trumps your right to have your own life and go off and abandon him. So uh, her point is that you cannot simply argue this is a human because this is what was quite revolutionary about the thought experiment was she said, I'm not going to argue about the humanity of the fetus. I don't, you know, she doesn't, um, and I, I agree with her, she doesn't personally think that a fetus is human at, or a person at every single stage of its development. I mean, I think we well, I, she feels, and I would agree with her, that the later in the development the fetus is, the more arguable, the more strongly arguable it is that it is a human, that it is a person. But um, mm. she, she said, let's just leave all that aside. Let's not sort of think about where do we draw the line. One side of the line, it's a person. The other side of the line, it's not a person. Let's just assume we're always dealing with a person. Can you then argue that it's a person, it's, it's human, there's a human right to life, therefore you cannot um, ever do anything that would result in the death of uh, an innocent, hu a blameless human being. Um, and so she, she's sort of, that's her purpose in, in using that example. It's, just, it's to undermine that um, kind of syllogism, the underlying syllogism of that argument. Uh, she isn't mm -hmm. trying to say that all pregnancy is like being kidnapped and attached to an unknown violinist. She's not trying to say that. She's just trying to say, if you accept that that argument, human, right to life, therefore you can't do anything that interferes with that right to life, you've, you've got to foster that right to life. If you accept that that fails in these circumstances, then you've already conceded that your argument, your fundamental argument doesn't work. Um, so that that was my um, that was my take on it. Um, uh, Bruce um, dis discussed it gen generally. We we sort of had a, a bit of an exchange. He didn't think much of of the violinist thought experiment, although I, I don't know that I, I don't know that I ever got why. I don't know that he that for me from my perspective, he ever quite drilled down into why he felt. It could so easily be dismissed. But he did have some interesting um, points to make about acquiring uh, parental responsibility and how we might, as how we as society, see parental responsibility as being um, acquired. And he had a sort of contrary thought experiment. And his thought experiment was, um, uh, say, a man and a woman go off to some very remote area um, and say, you know, they're partners, they're having sexual intercourse. They, um, ha they don't intend to get pregnant. They're taking pre uh, precautions, but it doesn't work. The woman gets pregnant. She has no alternative but to go through with the pregnancy. The baby is born um, and they look after it briefly, but then they just go off and leave um, and leave it. Um, and he was, uh, you know, he said, wouldn't we think in those circumstances that they had a, in some way, even though they'd never chosen to have a child, they nonetheless had acquired parental responsibility, which I thought was, you know, was a good point. Yes. I've heard that one before where the couple just happen, happen across a baby and start looking after it. Oh, right. Yes, I think, well, you see, I think that would be the difference because if once, um, the, argu the argument that uh, Thompson puts is that parental responsibility is something you accept, that when you take the baby, if you take the baby home with you, then you've volunteered, you've accepted the responsibility for that baby. So I think you, you certainly do acquire a responsibility if you find a baby and look after it. I think there's more of an issue about if you um, mm -hmm. find a baby and then you just keep on walking, uh, then, then that's... Um, but I, I, well, I, even that, I would... You know, if you see a baby sitting on a doorstep, you, 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 and it's a cold night, you know, an abandoned baby on a doorstep and it's a cold night, I, I feel you have a moral duty to pick it up and take it to the hospital. Oh, I agree. I agree you've got a moral duty. Work, but yeah. um, yes, no, I agree you've got a moral duty. Perhaps one of the points I should have made is that I was arguing that 
you not all moral duties should be legal duties should there be a legal oh duty? yes that's should right. there be a legal duty on you to pick up the yes. child and uh, take it to the hospital well you know i could i think you can maybe see that that that's actually a bit more it's potentially arguable but in most jurisdictions um you don't have a kind of good samaritan legal duty mm. there's a, there can be a moral duty to be a good samaritan <coughs> But most legislations don't impel, you know, require you as a matter of law to be mm. a good Samaritan. They just sort of say, oh, if you are a good Samaritan, that's fantastic. If you're not a good Samaritan, that may make you a horrible person, a horrible, vile, wicked person. But it, we're not actually going to bring the force of the law yes. on yeah. you. Yes, um, I get why, because if you're a lawyer and you need to bring your expertise to the, to the discussion, uh, why you made it. Um, a legal question rather than a moral question that was <laughs> being discussed. Um, but I think everyone else in the room were quite happy to sort of slide into morality issues. Oh, I think, I think it's a lot, it's a lot. I am concerned with what the law makes women do. That, that's, that's, you know, I, uh, so for me, I could, I could not like a woman's choice. I mean, I could be quite distressed by a woman's choice, but that's a different question from whether the law ought to intervene and prohibit her from making the choice. Some women will say it should be only women should discuss issues of abortion. And I, my general, in general, my response to that is no. You know, this is a, a general moral question. Anybody can, can uh, talk about that. But during the break, while we were having that debate, I was talking to, you know, just um, having a drink with and talking to one of the uh, audience members who, um, who said, oh, well, not only do I think that, um, uh, yes, what I was saying was, if you, th if you say the, ma the woman and the fetus have an equal right to life, then that means that the woman against her will could, if a doctor decided, a doctor could say, Mm, well, of the two of you guys, I'm going to go with the fetus. So sorry, you're just going to have to die. You know, you're just going to have to passively wait for death by pregnancy. Um, and uh, I was talking to uh, one of the audience about that. And he said, well, not only do I think that, that the doctor ought to be allowed to say that. In fact, I think to probably the doctor should give preference to the fetus. Uh, because generally, we do think that um, children should be protected over and above adults. So I think, you know, if it's a choice between the woman and the fetus, generally, it should go the way of the fetus. And I have to say, that really did push me <laughs> to the limits of my tolerance of men yes. <laughs> expressing opinions on abortion. This yeah. brings up yeah. a whole other aspect, um, Ed, I was going to mention then, Francis, this, this verse about value, because a lot of this talk was, funny enough, I, I did respect very much that Bruce is, he, he did the whole thing really without bringing in the faith. Um, yes, yes, he course, did. Yes, uh, was it totally was unaccepted by some people, presumably. And I thought that was well, the only bit that it got a bit um, sort of a bit hazy and problematic was that he was trying to find a sort of an, in, uh, an inherent difference within humanity to the animal kingdom of value without faith or belief in sort of mm. something. And just almost like, to me, I felt it was a bit circular and special pleading. There's something different about it. Yes, you. it didn't really, it didn't work. He didn't called really it work. rational substance. Yes. At the end of the day, you might as well have someone saying the Bible says. I mean, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's just like, um, it was a statement, wasn't it? Uh, oh, Yes, right. when he was pushed on it, it, it all seemed to fall apart in his hands. Now, he said animals didn't have a right to life, and Phil came right in there and sort of really questioned, you know, oh, animals don't have a right to life. And said, so, well, how do you know that? If, you, if you're not going to make the God case in this, Animals don't have a right to life, and, and most of us eat animals. And it's like, oh my gosh, um, Phil has a different take on that. But it was—it seemed to me that he was um, just d dismissive that animals, you know, some animals you can just see the humanity almost in them, as you yes. mentioned about bonobos or tribal apes communities and things. There's similar things going on in 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 a, in a way that we have an affinity with. And yeah. suddenly they don't have a right to life. You know, well, we have this rational substance, yeah. according to Bruce, but and. Um, yeah. And that rational substance is still, it, well, it's already there immediately at conception, which is why uh, it's not like um, a slowly, a slowly developing soul or whatever in in the womb. That abortions are no no right from the start. Yeah, 
And if you tied this back into our previous subject with Dennis Alexander, with the whole of the Homo sapiens sort of evolving and branching off and Neanderthals going one way and, 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 and Homo sapiens going the other, you know, one wonders where the value started. I mean, you know, because if he's saying that animals, if we're all, you see, that's the problem, isn't it? If, if he accepts evolution and we're all branched off, then where do you, it raises all kinds of questions, doesn't it? Because where do you suddenly say, you know, you'd have to yeah. say something happened to a particular group of hominids to give them this intrinsic value to separate them from animals that don't have it. You know, yeah. um, close animals like like Neanderthal, you know. Um, if you'd like to call Neanderthals animals, they're somewhere along the line, aren't they? Yes. So, um, but anyway, the question I wanted to make is that I thought, well, okay, we've got to get into the Bible somehow. I mean, this is a Christian uh, skeptical uh, or religious or faith discussion group. And I, I was really interested when it comes to the notions of value of human beings in the Bible. I mean, this is the book that is bashed about on people's heads over this very issue with abortion. And uh, I did some research on this. It's not been my subject. And um, I, I touched into a few things out of interest. But I was amazed, actually. And things were kicking off for me in my mind. And I, I found a particular passage that I'd never read before or taken, taken on board in this way. And uh, Ed, do you want to explain how that came about when I shared it with you? Yes, well, do you want to cue the music for... Oh. Is that in the Bible? Is that really in the Bible? The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, If anyone makes a special vow to dedicate a person to the Lord by giving the equivalent value, set the value of a male between the ages of 20 and 60, at 50 shekels of silver, according to the sanctuary shekel. For a female, let her value be 30 shekels. For a person between the ages of 5 and 20, set the value of a male at 20 shekels and of a female at 10 shekels. For a person between 1 month and 5 years, Set the value of a male at five shekels of silver and that of a female at three shekels of silver. For a person 60 years old or more, set the value of a male at 15 shekels and of a female at 10 shekels. Okay, well, I um, sort of reread this verse and hadn't really taken it on board at all in, in the context. But when I was thinking of looking at verses to do with human value, in any, just, to, just even using the language, before we even get into the meaning and the context, just the language of value, I, I was absolutely, I mean, we, we, we can pass right over the inequality between uh, female and male here. I mean, yes, quickly. Just jump over that. Really quickly. Quite notice. Yes, um, <laughs> it fits perfectly with an uninspired ancient sort of um, culture view of patriarchy and women. So it's perfect for that, but it's not perfect for an inerrant, inspired Bible, in my view. But hey, we're not here to talk about the uh, the less value for would be given to Francis than me and you, Ed. Uh, so uh, how do you feel about being 30 shekels and me and Ed 50? Um, no. <laughs> um, so we'll pass over that. But what's really interesting is, is worst of all, I sent this to Ed. And Ed? Yeah, well, I thought, oh, that's, that's Poe. That's been written in Bible League language um, as, as a joke to make sport. And uh, <laughs> I, I said, no, I protest. <laughs> Yeah, so I looked it up and blimey, it was there. <laughs> now, yeah. doesn't this consistently happen when you do read the Bible like with fresh eyes? It does, doesn't it? It things yes, just completely right. hit you and you go, I had this at college. I, I was reading Bible. Bible verses and I was going, well, obviously that's not in the Bible. That was maybe my first reaction. And then I read it. <laughs> you know, it was like, you know. <laughs> um, but anyway, so to get to, Francis, what was your reaction to it? Um... Well, I, uh, I will say I'm only 10 shekels. Sadly, I come, I come under verse 7, ah. so I'm, I'm only 10 shekels. Right. Um, but, um, uh, yes, I, uh, I'm trying to th think how um, a, uh, an evangelical would respond to this, and I suppose they'd say what they tend to say about slavery, that, oh, well, you've got to look at how it was at the time, and... Just the fact of the matter was that a man was a was an earner back in those days, and a woman not so much. And so, you know, it's just reflecting what they would have brought to the family. I mean, I guess that's what they'd say. 
I don't know. What are you saying? Yeah, they do. They do. They do say something like that. But I mean, it doesn't. Uh, first of all, the things I've read skip right over the male and female thing because uh, it, it normally comes up in actually the value and often in abortion discussions. What's interesting about this passage is that um, regardless of trying to see what it's really talking about, it makes these distinctions between male and female. It makes the distinctions between age. You can see what's happening, that the, the younger you get, the less value you've got in terms of shekels, and the older you get, the less value you've got. It's likely to be doing temple service or something like that, um, that your value as a worker is probably related to this. But what's really interesting is that you get down to a month and five years and it's what five seconds is it uh, mm. still the breakdown between a man and female yes, and then there's right, nothing yeah. from up to a month and so, yeah, so you're, worthless, yeah. you're worthless yeah now mm. you may be worth it somebody said well okay you're worthless because you can't do this and that but i mean the fact is it does give a price for five months uh, sorry one month and up to five years i mean if you're talking about temple service or somebody what, what what's what's a two month going to be doing in the temple <laughs> <laughs> you know i mean it's like um so so it, it seems to me that the 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 well i've heard one argument is this is that because babies died so often it wasn't even worth giving them a value because uh, they would probably die you know but that proves the point again i mean if babies are dying left right and center yeah, uh, in in this culture, it, it it seems that with along with other passages, and then from my mind, any god that says go in and kill men, women, and the suckling, as it says in the King James, and the, or the baby or the infant, put them through with a sword, the sanctity of life is gone right out of my estimation in in God's view because um, it's not like oh don't kill the sucklings because they have infinite value, and down the years in two thousand and something. You know, uh, Christians will be supporting the cause of the infinite value of the child and no abortion. You know, I can't see how this fits into the Old Testament no. way, the violence against children um, under God's command in those contexts like the flood, Sodom and Gomorrah, the Canaanites slaughters, you know, um, even King David's son. You know, mm. well, what did God do as judgment? He um, um, young, young child, I don't know how old, but. The value, it was like he punished David by letting the son have a disease, cause the disease, I think, and then David's son, child, died. Yeah, yeah, yes. okay, yeah. You know, this and, is, uh, and Pharaoh's what? son, Pharaoh's son died, didn't he? Is yeah. that right? Well, the whole, all the first born. Well, I've had, yes, all the first born. Which would have included a lot of yeah. young uh, sort of infants. Did any of you mention today already the one about the fight? Uh, where, where two men are fighting and accidentally we haven't talked about that yeah that's, that's another one if, so if a woman, pregnant woman gets hit yes uh, um, and um, the, her, her fruit comes out or something like that that's right so people mm -hmm. say well that, that must mean a live birth but the whole the rest of us doesn't really make sense if, no, um, I, no some people have tried to that, say well that's... if the baby comes out but there's no harm done I mean you, if a baby comes out in that culture in, in, it, it's, not, it's not the 21st century with hospital wards right around the corner you know, if a baby comes out, you're talking that is harm done. <laughs> uh, to, yeah. to, to the, and, and maybe maybe it's even referring to the fact that the mother uh, is injured because of this. And it's referring to the mother, not the, the child's life seems to be inconsequential. I think, I think that's the, um, uh, that, that's the, um, the argument between yeah. those who interpret. It's this, this passage, which is Exodus 21, verse 22, 22. onwards, mm -hmm. um, is used by both pro and yes. um, anti-abortionists. Yep. So um, it's used by, um, and including some, there are some Christians who are, who are pro-choice. Um, of course there are. And they will, they will use this, <laughs> they will use this, uh, this passage yeah. to say, uh, uh, and so will atheists, to uh, kind of attack um, those who base um, their anti-abortion stance on the Bible by saying, well, look, the Bible treats um, causing an abortion as um, uh, just a financial, a fina you know, a civil matter that, where you repay somebody for the, the loss of, um, of, of, the, uh, of what would have been your offspring. But it, it, it's not treated as, as, as murder or, or in the same way as, as killing an adult. But no, it, it, because, because the words used in the original Hebrew text, and I don't, read i mean i understand it i think it's like what what you said um uh, ed that you know the child comes out of her or something and uh, the tendency these days is to um uh present that as gives birth prematurely 
she, rather than saying she, she miscarries. I mean, I think at one time it was generally accepted that was a reference to a miscarriage. Right. But now there's a lot of dispute about, oh, you know, it's not clear that it's saying that it's a miscarriage. Um, might just be saying gives birth prematurely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Give, giving so birth prematurely is... in that culture, in that particular setting, would have been pretty well established that it would die. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So it, you would not... think so. You would think so. I mean, yeah. the, what they'll say yeah. is that um, uh, if they're, they're then they say, well, that's the serious injury. Uh, the ser- if the if the child dies or or it, um, they're doing the value injured, it. then then that's what the following verses are about: life for life, eye for an eye, and so on. But mm. I'm I would say the the proper interpretation is that it's talking about the woman. I would so, say that as well. Um, so for the loss of yeah. the for the loss of the child, you must pay the the woman's husband. Uh, but if the woman dies or is is seriously injured, then that's where the um, uh, eye for an eye, uh, tooth for a tooth, yeah. foot for a foot. It says burn for burn, so that just doesn't make sense. If it's a pregnant woman somehow being attacked and the baby gets burnt. So it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that the most natural reading, if you looked at, say, just the culture and the other verses in the Bible, that sort of the way that it seems to imply that life is kind of cheap, that in fact, infant fetus life is actually the cheapest and is more disposable yeah. than the greatest value. I mean, even just, just, just like I said, you know, the slaughters go and kill the suckling and the infant. I mean, where is like, you would have had, surely you would have had whatever you do, you get those babies and you bring them back to Israel and you bring them up as your own. No, we don't. We get put a sword through them. So, um, and pregnant women as well would have been ripped open in those contexts. And so, um, you know, unless you, unless you had this distinction between an Israelite child has some great value and a Canaanite has none, that's even worse. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, um, so um, anyway, this is what yeah. I was thinking about when you were doing your talk, as opposed to other people would have been much more in the law the court cases as, 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 as you were doing, Francis. So um, I sort of went off on my own thoughts about these issues. <laughs> and we love your thoughts, it. Andrew. Yes. yes, well, yes. My <laughs> thoughts are not your thoughts and my <laughs> ways are not your ways. Oh, we've done this before. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay let, let's rescue this and, and get on to James uh, Crossley yes. and Mark's Gospel. Um, so James, uh, uh, he came to, he's not a, not a Christian and never has been, um, and he came to it sort of through his academic studies and was fascinated and got into it all. He has moved on to other things. So actually that was quite good because he had a bit more perspective about it all because um, he, he was working more deeply on Mark about, he, up to about 20 years ago, I think it was. Mm. Um, and an early thing he got into was the dating of Mark and he thought it was around uh, AD 40. He now backtracks from that and saying, he doesn't know. It could be AD 40. Um, and the reason given was uh, this uh, desecration uh, of the temple and the weird way that it was described. And he said that fits in very well with um, something that happened in Caligula's reign around about AD 40 uh, and is quite well documented of the, the desecration of the temple then. And that could have been the prompt. Um, the most other scholars go for AD seventy with a fairly well detailed description of the fall of Jerusalem in Mark, um, and they so they put it there. Um, so the what was interesting was that the reasons he was giving for the dating both ways was a very secular reason assuming that Jesus couldn't possibly have known this in advance because he was just a bloke. And therefore, using that assumption, we know when the gospel was written. Um, and so it's a bit ironic that people are le- leaping on it, saying, evangelicals saying, oh, it proves that Jesus is, is real and he said he, who he said he was and rushed it because it's so early. Huh. And James does cope with that, but I don't think the, the sort of starkness of, of how all this dating discussion is based on a deeply secular assumption. It's a very um, interesting point that you make. And I have thought about this before. Um, I come from the other angle where um, I've had people say to me when I was young that, you know, it's um, Jesus is predicting the future from the AD sort of 30 setting 40 years ahead of time because he's supernatural son of God, that sort of thing. And uh, of course, when, when you don't have that, then you, 
become skeptical and think it's written after the fact and that's that's the assumption so i was well aware of of coming from that angle um so it's very interesting that you should say that and the dating it's surprising actually that the dating is largely around um Mar- with mark on on the um chapter 13 with the um olivet discourse yeah um setting and it's like okay if this is all about jerusalem's destruction then it's just after it's happened everyone knows about it and and now you're recasting jesus but that's not the way evangelicals would see it yes so why is it the evangelicals seem quite happy to go along with the consensus of the dating yeah i mean it's it's really surprising this because i remember robert m price said something that really made me laugh a long time ago on his podcast he was saying look if you're an evangelical particularly fundamentalist and you believe the bible is inspired and inerrant it wouldn't really matter if it was written 15 minutes ago <laughs> Do you know what I mean? In comparison yeah. to, and yet when it comes to, uh, I mean, it's, if you think about it, it wouldn't really matter because, I mean, of course, because lots of people existed, but let's just say it was written in AD 300 and the events happened in AD 30. It wouldn't matter if you think that this is inspired and inerrant from the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter. Whereas it yeah. does matter to everybody that if you can get this book back as early as you can, they're working on still natural assumptions. And what's those natural assumptions? The earlier you get, the less chance for embellishment and legend. Um, it seems to be pretty obvious. And that's a, still a secular assumption. Um, you know, um, what about an inerrant Bible 300 years later that's supernatural? <laughs> you, know, um, yes. or what, you know, so... Um, well, that's what they think Genesis 1 is. And Genesis... Exactly. That's another yeah. point. When I, when, that's very good you said that, Ed, because when I thought about this, when Robert M. Price said that, I thought, yeah, 1,500 year the closest you've got if, if, even probably 2000 years before the early Genesis story and the time when people were hearing it and writing about it, you know, um, uh, or putting it to, to, to pen as it were, or, or however it was sort of done back then. And you're thinking, Oh, you're trusting that as inerrant, you know, uh, it's yes. exactly what happened. Adam did this, the snake said that. And then suddenly you get to the gospel of Mark studies and you think, Oh my gosh, a secular scholar, atheist scholar, let's say atheist scholar believes that Mark was written in AD 60. Oh, it must be truer than we thought it was. Yes. Yeah, so I, mean, I, can, I can understand them doing that. <laughs> I look, even under your own assumptions, yes. we can show that this is accurate reporting. Yeah. But they don't yeah. then say, but of course we know it was written earlier or later on, they just sort of say, yeah, we know that it was written by 87 I, I, th- I think, Ed, I can probably give an answer to this that, that's actually a bit more nuanced than, than that assumption. And that's, that's the classic critical study view of, I think it is the word ex eventua. Uh, there's something like that, which means it's written after the effect and yet cast in the sense of forward thinking. So like the book of Daniel or whatever. Yes. Um, and what, what it is though, it's not like, Oh, well you just don't have a supernatural belief in, in telling the future. So no wonder you're going to take these secular assumptions, but no, hold on, hold fire because some of these books outside of the Bible that are, are a pseudographic sort of literature that project the future, they are absolutely like accurate. So I've read, to the contemporary time they're written and then they fail because they do make a prediction and it doesn't happen. Okay. Yes. Now you've got the classic one here and we've talked about this. That was Jesus a failed apocalyptic prophet. Now, if he's projecting in AD 30 ish, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, he's also equating it with the coming of the son of man and the judgment of the whole world. Uh, in the classic sense, that means it hasn't happened. Okay. Which means that the, the gospel reader today would say it was called the delay of the parousia which is the delay of the second coming um it didn't happen and so therefore you would say okay the writer of mark saw the destruction of jerusalem thought it was going to bring in very quickly the second coming and therefore we can date mark that way he said okay so it's all right about jerusalem being destroyed so that's probably when mark was written but but actually the writers or jesus himself or it's put in jesus mouth and that makes that raises all sorts of questions about if jesus did say it then he was wrong mm. and if he if he didn't say it then mark was wrong because he mark mm. thought it was going to happen and it didn't yeah see what i mean so this is more nuanced and yeah. this i think we do know that jesus said it because of paul earlier on was reporting it as well well yes so therefore that's a good um uh th- this generation's not passed away maybe um it linked into that um yes. uh, or some tasting death and obviously paul was an apocalypticist he thought things were going to happen very soon within his lifetime and of course you know a lot of people observing the scriptures would say it's uh didn't happen basically yeah, in yeah, yeah. years down the line yeah 
Uh, okay, so let's get back to James because he yeah. wasn't that much on that material. No, he wasn't. No. <laughs> um, I think what well what what he said was that even if you do date it around AD forty, you still really haven't got a whole lot more progress than if you date it at AD seventy, hmm. because there's a there's still plenty of time for stories to be made up. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. Not made up in a deceptive way; they just sort of develop. Um, so sort of Chinese, Chinese whispers. I think there's an element of that. And he did. He said, "Look, if you look at all of this, uh, when an apologist in this sort of era is trying to make an argument, they use a story. They make up a story to sort of show the point. And when a counter apologist right. who's trying to who's trying to poo poo Jesus." Uh, responding to this they also make up stories they're not they don't use modern sort of rational arguments and saying you haven't got the evidence or anything like that they just have some counter story to pedal yes yeah yeah so that was fresh i'd never really heard of that before Um, yes well i mean i think it's um a comment that i've i've made before that you can look at the gospels as fan fiction You know, they were written by fans of Jesus who wanted to project, this is what, you know, this is my understanding of Jesus. This is what I would have expected him to say. This is what he must have meant. Um, So I I think... uh, I think James um, wouldn't agree with you. He'd say, but yes, that is a certain... uh, We can... It's open for us to say that, but we don't mm. know. uh, That's the big thing that came... If there's one point that's... It shot was, through we, his we talk. Don't know. we just know almost nothing now something that i was i was so sad i missed it because of the, the the big thing i'm longing to hear more on is this messianic more on oh sorry sorry <laughs> <laughs> to hear more from james about all right sorry yeah. it's the messianic secret. Yeah. Yeah. and actually you he he talked and then he hadn't covered it so you picked it up which was great i did. i remember you said to me if one thing you pick up the messianic secret so um i did yes yeah. And he was great because it, uh, uh, what struck me when I read Mark, I, I just did an exercise, I read Mark, so okay, I think there's a secrecy thing going on. Let's read it all through. I think I must have heard of the Messianic Secret, but never really mm. read it. About well, maybe you could just explain to the audience, for anyone who's listening and go, Messianic what? Yes, okay. Mm. Um, so um, the, this hit, hit the public in about 1900. A German chap, I've forgotten his name, begins with a V, uh, he said, um, it, if you read Mark, it looks like he is keeping his messianic nature completely secret, just with the inner circle, and it only comes out at the end. And the best way to explain this is that Jesus never was a messianic claimant, and it was only after his death that people wanted to say that, and so they had to invent a way of Jesus having been saying he was the Messiah all along and it was kept secret uh, just in the inner circle. And now we can tell you after the resurrection that actually this was the case all along. So that, that was, uh, and you can make quite a good case for that, but obviously scholars have, have knocked some big corners off, off that argument and it is much more rounded now. Yeah. Um, and What James was saying was something that struck me when I read the whole of the gospel is it's a mess. It's a secrecy theme over a lot of things, not just uh, whether Jesus was Messiah or not. Yeah. And strikingly absent from the other gospels. Yeah, there's because the other gospels copy Mark quite carefully in places. It can't help but get through. But it's not the same as in, in the other Gospels. Yeah. And especially, obviously, in John, it's completely the opposite. Yeah, yeah, yes. I, I tell everyone from the roof, uh, speak publicly to everything, there's nothing I keep in secret. There's a passage in John yeah, that so says that, that. He's right in the middle of Jerusalem, loud and proud, saying, yeah. I'm the Father of One. Like, hang around, are you the same Jesus that uh, is telling anyone not to <laughs> tell anyone anything? And, oh, we know, he's over there. You feel like you're in the Monty Python film, you know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know I mean? Oh, that yes. one, the secret Jesus is walking around Galilee telling no one to tell anything. And then this one's in Jerusalem telling everybody everything. Yes. So it's fascinating. Yeah. And that parable of the sower, and in the middle there's this thing, they, I only tell things in parables. And the reason is so that people could be kept in the dark. It, exactly. So, that, so it, it's, it's, it's a bit it's Gnostic. Everywhere. It's a bit yeah. Gnostic, actually. It's a bit like we're in the know and you're not. 
And mm. Matthew does seem to correct that by quoting the Old Testament. And you seem to think they're hardened for a reason back then because they will not hear or something. Whereas in Mark, you definitely get the impression that that the disciples have got a special insight because if the others did, then they would turn and be healed. And it's the exact opposite to what you think an evangelist should be, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Now I have a theory about all this. My, my little pet theory that's, that's oh, yeah. a, so people shouldn't treat me too seriously, but I want, to tell, I want to tell everybody my theory. Yes. And, um, and James, it's sort of slightly backed it up, but if I'd asked him directly, I would have thought he would, he would have, um, well, if it turns up in one of his Dismissed. books, he's nicked it from you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so here's my theory. What is mine? Yeah. Um, the secrecy <laughs> theme is all about Mark giving a story of Jesus, an account of Jesus, which goes counter to his first audience. Uh, so they have this view of Jesus, and Mark is trying to make it different. And they are basing their view of Jesus on the tradition handed down from the apostles. Um, and Mark is trying to say, no, that's not quite right. I, it's this. And that's, and the method he uses is to say, well, it was a kept a secret. Um, so certain things which are open in Mark, like Jesus did healings in Galilee. Um, okay. You, you all know that I'm not trying to go against it, but that Jesus said he was the Messiah um for all through uh no that that was he was but he only said it in secret and then a big one is um the witnesses are all around the tomb which this is what james just pick up on that so my theory is that the first hearers didn't really know of the empty tomb um and mark is trying to say yes there was an empty tomb and you never knew about it because the women uh, ran away frightened and never told anybody. And that's why the tomb um, isn't known. But now I'm telling you all along there was an empty tomb, but you just hadn't heard about it because the women had told nobody. So that fits with the same sort of feel as the messianic secret and all the other secrecy themes uh, through Mark. Exactly. So that, you would have to, what you mean. You would have to get to, you you'd have to get to the position though of how Mark knew. Um, so somebody must have said something if that was the only witnesses. Um, and, but I, I, whereas I think that the more skeptical view makes even more sense that Mark made it up because he's the omniscient narrator can put thoughts into anything in anybody like roll J. Well, I am, I am, that's my sub subtext. Right. Sort of, okay. Yeah. Like, like, like JK Rowling can know all the thoughts and everything and everything that's going to happen to the Harry Potter characters because she is the inventor whereas um you can understand how mark could know that way but to know in the sense that well the women didn't tell anybody but somebody was listening around the corner and passed it down slowly yeah. <laughs> you know um yeah. so so that's what you'd have to really that that's immediately the <clears throat> critique would come yes and, and when jesus the only time jesus really clearly says his messiah is in a meeting in at his trial um, and so no Christians and no disciples were anywhere near it. Near that. And again, you've got to have, yes. how do you get, again, it's the omniscient narrator again, seems to know the thoughts of Jesus in private. Um, again, it's yes, uh, yeah. problematic, isn't it? Um, yeah. Well, not problematic if you go a supernatural route, but then you're starting with supernatural assumptions. So, yeah. Um, yeah. But, um, I mean, but yeah. I, yeah my, my theory doesn't exactly work for everything. So um, like uh, the, disciples were supposed to know be able to tell after the resurrection that jesus was messiah and all that kind of thing um I mean, and so they must have been about you know the key disciples in the jerusalem church yeah i mean the disciples that are presented almost like um again the other gospels change it and tidy it up or don't even include it but got, the disciples in mark are very very poor th thick and dim-witted and yes. they don't get it. And so much so that you have two stories of the feeding of the 4,000 and the 5,000. And the surprising thing is, is that it doesn't seem like it's that long distance apart. And yet when they get to the second one, they go, how all these people haven't got food? How shall we feed them? And the, the answer, uh, what Jesus says, you know, were you not uh, with me 
for the feeding of the thing and it's like they could have gone oh yeah yeah we were yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so it's yeah. almost like um mark um, is trying to undermine their their witness yeah so that he can correct them yeah probably they're almost foils for um the audience i.e mm. the audience now he's the son of god when you start reading it uh, um yeah. you know um but 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 the disciples don't and they don't know he's going to die and suffer and all the rest of it so it looks like seems to me that mark is jumping over the foil of the characters of the, the disciples to get to the reader, uh, which actually is not how you do recording history. Um, you know, it, it, with all of this sort of narrative, I mean, even if you have a secrecy theme that the others don't have, you've already moved away from a historical narration. Um, you've got themes, you know, what are themes? Yes. You know, if you're going to report, you're in a newspaper, modern reporting anyway, go and report what's happened. There's been a bomb that's gone off at the YouTube. You don't start putting secrecy themes in your article, <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> and, and, and um, yeah. you don't go immediately this and immediately that and, and, and have sort of a drop off ending. So it's ancient. Even if it is historical, it's ancient way of doing it. And secondly, it's not eyewitness. It's not saying, oh, I was here. And we, I heard this, do you know what? I, I, I heard this conversation from Jesus and he said to so-and-so, it's like little stories of units put together in a rapid way. Yeah, I, you know. I, I mean, I know it seems a very simplistic point and I know that um, apologists have an answer for it, but it, it just does seem to me that it is extraordinarily odd that if, uh, this isn't talking about Mark particularly, but um, that if people are supposed to be, to have been, to be telling a story as an eyewitness, that they never talk in the in the first person, singular no. or plural, and no. I don't know. Nobody nobody seems to think that find that as odd as as I find it. But it, maybe that's just me. Uh, no, I think it's a reasonable thing. Mm-hmm. The gospels are all anonymous, really, and uh, they they st- they take for general part. Uh, this um, except for bits in the book of acts this um, third person stuff and it's like it's like again it looks much more like the omniscient narrator idea do you, you know yeah. what jesus was saying in, in on his own in the garden of gethsemane you know the thoughts mm-hmm. of the devil you know jesus when he was taken up to the mountain you know what it, 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 you, a fundamentalist has to posit some sort of uh, little man running around with a pad you know um, <laughs> and to ask him questions yeah. what are you thinking now lord because this is going to go down in an inerrant bible it's just not like yeah. that, you know. Yeah. Or, d- or direct inspiration. Or direct, direct inspiration. inspiration. So, so you. Yeah. D- so what, and again, you back to my point. If you have direct inspiration, it doesn't matter if it was written in AD thirty. Um, uh, sorry, AD three hundred instead yeah. of AD thirty. But no, everyone jumps on the fact. If they found a Gospel of Mark that surfaced in the forties that was dug up, it would be the rejoicing. Yeah. Ever it you would just say, well, I knew yeah. it was narrow anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. so anyway, so yeah, so okay, I yeah, we're, we're running out of time, but yeah. um, I think we have to say how Mark ends. That was that's the key we thing. We do that, uh, the ending of Mark is fascinating. Mm. Um, so if people who are familiar with this, um, it has this very strange direct ending that was later corrected uh, by adding uh, a big chunk of text, probably 180 years later. Um, and no, a hundred years later, sorry, oh. AD, about AD. Yeah, AD. about a hundred years afterwards, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and James is of the opinion, again, not he doesn't know anything for sure, but he, he <laughs> leans towards Mark did actually write it with this very abrupt and strange ending, and that, that was on purpose. Yes, there's a split in the scholarly community, um, basically, between the ending of Mark was actually lost, like the end of a codex or something, you know, the last page or something was ripped out. And so what we've got in the oldest manuscripts is is dropped off at verse eight. And it does seem to apparently in Greek, just cut off in a word that you just unusually don't end there. So that's that's the way that they start and say, okay, so we've lost you know, but this raises questions for the fundamentalist. What are you doing losing part of the inerrant inspired Bible? I mean, what was it? Did the inspiration stop at verse eight? And then, you know, um, and so it's, um, it does seem a little bit um, interesting that, that one can go and say, well, we've actually lost the end of an inerrant authoritative word of God Bible, you know, <laughs> text. Yes. Um, that seems odd to me. So a lot of people now go the other way and say, no, this was a very th- in line with Mark's literary structure rather than historical. We've got themes and patterns, and one of them is to end in this kind of oblique way. What do you have thoughts about that, both of you? Oh, gosh. Um, 
Well, you you go first, Ed. This is more your area than mine. <laughs> I, I, I think the ending is intended. I, I agree with, with... Well, I exactly agree with James that we don't know for sure, but my balance is that it ended where it's... Where it, verse 8, where, it's, where the women flee and tell nobody. Yeah, I mentioned to James there, and then you may have heard it briefly if you heard me speak, probably clearer, actually, because I was nearer the phone, um, when I mentioned another scholar that I read, and it was quite an intriguing thing. And he was saying that because of the secrecy theme about don't tell anyone, don't tell anyone, whatever you do, don't tell anyone. Um, then when we get to the end, we get actually the angel, oh, do tell someone now, and then they don't. Yeah. Whereas all the other yeah. times, in fact, if you noticed a lot of the other times when he says don't tell anyone, they actually ignore him and do. And, mm. um, and so or some of the passages are hint that way. And so if you if you're going with themes, you could say that the ultimate contrast here is this. Um, yeah, uh, this 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 sort of thing. And then it's literary for whatever literary reason was back then yeah. in the first century. It makes for an intriguing I, I, I tend to be more impressed with that than the idea that something was lost and cut off and dropped off. And it's some buried parchment somewhere, you know, um, you know, yes. um, particularly when in the new passages that they ended with, it was really some bizarre stuff in there, like the snake handling and salvation comes through baptism. It looks like in one of the ways you read it, you know, and so, um, um, uh, it, and, and anyway, it's not just the one ending that's been added. There's been a short ending added. And so they didn't know what was going on. They were just throwing things in there. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, did show they weren't happy with the way we're thinking, though. Yeah, and they corrected yeah. that the women didn't say anything to anybody, or the other endings correct that. Yeah, so immediately they didn't say anything to anybody, and they make it sound like you know, oh well, when we get past this lamp toast, lamp post, then we will start talking. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's like they didn't say anything. You know, that, that's then, and then of course, uh, the, then they ran to tell the disciples. So, yeah, what did they have a change of mind, or they just you know, ten minutes had a problem with telling anyone <laughs> no that's the way it looks if you do have that ending um and jesus was a bit weird they didn't see it they didn't notice his form and there's a bit of strange language it does seem like second century language actually they say the greek is so different mm. uh, than, 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 than mark's greek so um yeah i, I suppose think. using occam's razor the um conclusion in the absence of any evidence to the contrary uh, should sway you towards that was the intended ending because I mean you know you can't just speculate about unless unless you've got some uh, something more you can't just speculate about oh there's a missing bit yeah I mean I mean mm. I have, tend to be a few more things to throw in there like you know apparently the Greek word is a very unusual word in any kind of thing in the surrounding culture to end like that so it'd be a bit like some, we could find something today and say well we wouldn't mm. end that. so that's what's raised people's question obviously the early church had a problem uh, with it because i suppose their problem sure. though, probably wasn't that it was probably the fact that hey you know matthew's gospel starting to put in appearances as in narrating the appearances and seeing them we have one in mark where it says he's going before you to galilee and that's it um i mean that's just a statement about what he's gonna do you know mm -hmm. um, luke doesn't even have that he says let's go straight to jerusalem and uh, stay there so um um, <laughs> um yeah but um, anyway, yes, I, I find I find all of this very, very interesting. I think for the fundamentalists, it should cause a lot more headaches. Um, but it's interesting for anyone else studying it as ancient literature. Um, yes, Luke Luke follows Mark's narr narration completely. The narrative in Mark, Luke follows carefully with the same ordering and everything. So when Luke had a copy of Mark, he wouldn't have had anything beyond what we have of Mark. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yes. And of course, he take and, and of course, Luke massively, and we talked about this before, Ed, that Matthew and Luke diverge so vastly when we get past the ending of Mark in both. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that you suddenly have Luke completely pushing it all to Jerusalem with no hints or going or anywhere apart from speculation that he could possibly get to Galilee. And in Matthew, uh, you, you can't even see where you could ever get to Jerusalem. It's all going back to the mountain in, in, in Galilee. So mm. um, it's like um, it's like they both are independently taking the story on further in their own way yes. from Mark. And ironically, right at the beginning, because Mark has Jesus come on the scene, boom, with his baptism, and the other two go wild before there. You know, yeah. it's fascinating, yeah. fascinating mm. stuff. Yeah. Sad we can't carry on because I think we, we really are running out of time. We are running out of time. Sure. And, um, yeah. and this is going to be, I'll, I, I will, um, 
I think it's going to be enjoyable though for anyone to do so. We'll put that on air. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're great fun. It's been fabulous <laughs> to do it, and it seems such a long time, but it isn't as far as anyone else is concerned. Yeah. As long as I can get it out as soon as we can. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. Yeah. Okay. okay, so we're doubtsallowed at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Yes, indeed. So um, put any questions there to us and um, I hope... Um, Give us a review. Yes, yes. just one review. One review, <laughs> one review. And if by chance the ending of the podcast should be cut off, I will just argue that I'm emulating Mark. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah let's finish, with the, word, or, finish with the word of.